Let's uh, head in without further ado in today's topic. Uh, we're going to talk about animal welfare. Uh, public opinion seems more and more sensitive today to the cause. But what do we actually know about the economics of animal welfare? We have two experts with us today, Nicolas Treche and Romain Espinoza. Nicolas and Romain are going to help us to take a closer look at the issue. Nicolas Treich, welcome. You had, uh, you hold a joint senior research position here at TSC, joint with the INRAE, which for those who are not in France and perhaps don't know, is France's National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment. You are also associated with the IST, which is our sister institute for pluridisciplinary research here in Toulouse. And you work on risk and decision theory, environmental economics, benefit cost analysis, and more recently, animal welfare. In France, you're quite well known as I think you can correct me, but I think two years ago, you launched in France with a colleague, the very popular Lundi Vert, which in English means the Green Monday, which is an initiative which has been very popular to encourage citizens to skip meat once a week for health and economic reasons. Perhaps we'll hear more about that later. Romain Espinoza, welcome. Romain, you're a researcher in economics at the French National Scientific Research Center, as we know here in France as the CNRS. You're based at the Univers University of Rennes, and you have specialized in decision-making uh, mechanisms and experimental methods. Your work focuses on plant nutrition and the animal condition, food choices, cognitive biases, political and social preferences. You wrote a book uh, recently on how to save animals in economic theory of animal welfare with the Poof Publishing House. And in 2019-20, you were also a visitor here with us at TSC and IST, so we're happy to have you back with us today. Um, I will give you the floor now, that's enough from me. Uh, over to you, both of you, for 20 minutes uh, introduction to today's topic. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Jennifer, for the this very nice introduction. Can you all see my screen? That's okay. I can. So I guess if oh. I can, everyone else can. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. So hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. So I'm very pleased to, to present today and to introduce some of our works with uh, Nicolas. It's been a few years we've been working on uh, animal welfare as economists. Uh, so today we will give you a, a small uh, overview of the challenges that we have uh, when we talk about animal use and uh, the, somehow uh, what we can do uh, to improve social welfare regarding um, animal welfare. So first of all, so today's talk will be divided into two parts. First, we will uh, discuss briefly the externalities associated with meat consumption and marginal animal use. So externalities for those who are not economists are arise whenever the decision of one person to consume a, a good or to make some action uh, generates uh, either positive or negative impact uh, on the utility of others. So here, for instance, for uh, regarding animal welfare, whenever we, so whenever we engage in animal use, it has an impact not only on the person, on the consumer, but also on the animals, uh, of course, uh, on our health, and on the environment. So we'll briefly discuss that. And then we will see how we can um, reduce the negative externalities associated with uh, animal use. Uh, what's the role of uh, ignorance, information, um, the challenge of cognitive dissonance, how NGO can uh, engage in the topic, um, uh, as well as new uh, market solutions such as uh, culture meat. So first of all, to introduce the topic, we would like to make a small a uh, question, small poll to um, to you, Jennifer. I think you have a question. Yeah, I'm just, thank you, Romain. Just a quick uh, no note to yourself. We can't see you. It would be very nice to see you if you could put your video on for us also. That would be fantastic. Oh, sorry, In the Romain. meantime, the first question for the audience today, please to feel free to reply. How many terrestrial farm animals do you think are killed each year worldwide? Would that be 700 million? 7 billion or 70 billion? Please click to answer the first question. We'll give you just a, a few seconds to finish that. Uh, 
And I think our technical team, there we go. Here's the results of the poll. So, um, Nicolas and Romain, can I let you perhaps comment the replies? Are the 35 or 69% of people right to say 70 billion? So actually there are. Um, um, so I'm sorry, just either my video or my screen. So actually they are quite, uh, so the majority of the participants today are right. Um, we have about uh, 70 billion animals that are killed each year um, worldwide. So as you can see here on the screen, those are data from the FAO, which is the UN organization for relating to, to food and agriculture. Um, and the vast majority of animals killed are chicken. Uh, they represent about 69 uh, billion animal kills every year. And at the lower end of the spectrum, very, very far away, we also have pigs, turkey, sheep, goats, and cattle. And altogether, those categories account about uh, 1 billion animals killed yearly. So chicken, uh, the main issue that we have regarding um, animal welfare is that uh, chicken, for instance, in Western uh, countries, are raised you know, mostly in uh, industrial farms with a very really, uh, high density of animals per square meter uh, without access to outdoors. So quite bad <clears throat> uh, rearing conditions for them. Uh, we also have pigs, uh, which is uh, becoming quite popular in countries like China also. Uh, those pigs are also raised in intensive farms uh, for most of them, which is also a, a big challenge for animal welfare. And finally, the animals maybe were the most used to uh, cattle, uh, of course, they are, so those animals maybe have the best um, rearing conditions today, but um, they are constitute the minor, very small minority of um, animal killed. So total consumption of meat, uh, so the, the consumption per capita has increased a lot uh, because it's strongly related to um, the economic development. So uh, as you can see here, uh, today's picture, uh, the largest uh, consumer for uh, meat is North America some countries in South America as well, uh, Europe. Um, China has increased a lot in the past decade with, of course, economic development. So almost all countries follow this uh, pattern, except uh, maybe India, uh, because of cultural reasons where you have a high share of uh, vegetarian. So that's why the projection uh, in, the, in the middle run are quite uh, alarming regarding the number of animals killed because the, I mean, as uh, developing countries are expected to, to grow, um, so the more uh, we are expecting to, to kill animals. <clears throat> what we can see also is that uh, there is a discrepancy between the number of animals killed and the number of animals suffering and how much we invest in helping those animals. So here are some figures from the United States. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have a graph about the number of animals that are either killed or used uh, in the US. So as you can see, most of them in the US are farmed animals, which is not uh, surprising. Um, only a tiny proportion of them are either labs, I mean, animals used in lab for experiments, or uh, animals in shelters, like dogs or cats that are um, euthanized. But here on the right-hand side, what you have is uh, the uh, money uh, given to this uh, charity. And in green, you have so the, the amount of the share of money that is given to shelters. And here in uh, light blue, you have the, the share of money given to farm animals. And as you can see, while farm animals represent the great majority of animals used and killed, uh, they represent only a very small minority of the funds uh, for um, animal charities. So just to give you a, one number about this figure, for one cat uh, or dog euthanized in the US, you have 3,400 farmed animals that are killed. So there is a, a strong discrepancy between the two. So animal use also, I mean, meat consumption also has an impact, uh, an externality on the health system uh, because people eat maybe uh, too much meat and uh, too few uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, disease that, origin that occur and uh, it has cost for the uh, burden for the global health system. So here, I just give you a, a few uh, figures. There are many papers about, uh, about that, but here are figures from uh, PNS in 2016, where they compare, they look at how many uh, deaths could be avoided uh, if we change our diet, either for a health, uh, guideline, sorry, health, um, healthy uh, guidelines, I mean, healthy guidelines, that is to say reducing uh, red meat and increasing uh, fruits and vegetables, vegetarian diet or a vegan diet. So as you can see, all countries, uh, in all regions in the world, sorry, would benefit from uh, the change, the increase in uh, vegetable and the decrease in uh, red meat consumption. 
So red meat, red meat is considered as cancerogen by the World Health Organization. Uh, that's why you have here in, in, um, in orange, the reduction in death due to the reduction in red meat. But of course, uh, shifting to plant-based diets, we'll, uh, it, it has two, kind, uh, two sides of the same coin. The first side is, is the benefits from, stop, from reducing meat. And the other side is uh, the benefits associated with the increase in fruits and vegetables. So this is true for all countries in the world, um, and especially uh, in developed countries where we, we eat much, uh, too, too much meat, but also in the long run for developing countries where they tend to greatly increase their meat consumption um, in the past few years. So now, Nicola, I let you have a few words about the environment. Yes, thank you, uh, Romain, and hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm starting uh, to talk about the environmental impacts of um, food products by showing you this uh, figure, uh, which is uh, circulating a lot uh, on, on social media in particular. So it's taken from Pour and Nemesek, a paper published in Science in 2018. It's probably the most comprehensive uh, study about the impacts uh, of uh, food on the environment. So here you see on the y-axis a number of uh, food products. And uh, on the x-axis, you have uh, greenhouse gases emissions per kilo of a product. Uh, and they, in, the, in the paper, they, they examine uh, five uh, environmental dimensions. So here I'm just showing one dimension, which is climate change. And the main result of this uh, paper is that there is a striking difference uh, between animal products and plant-based products. Uh, another uh, interesting uh, result from this uh, study is that they, as we do a life cycle analysis, we can see the respective contribution of each part of the production pro process. And you can see on the, on the figure that the green part, land use change, and the farm part especially, with uh, methane emissions and uh, also uh, nitrous oxide emission uh, are the, by far the largest uh, contributors here. And in contrast, for instance, transport does not contribute much. It's less than 5% of, uh, of food emissions on average. So that suggests, for instance, that uh, buying uh, local is not, uh, is not really as efficient as, uh, as uh, just uh, sweet, uh, changing diets toward more plant-based food. On the next uh, screen, on the left, you have again a, a contrast between uh, animal food in red and plant-based food in green with respect to their contribution to different uh, benefit and cost, let's say. So on the human nutrition side, you see that animal products uh, uh, only represent a few uh, small part of the calories, uh, higher part if we look at protein intake, for instance. But if we go at, uh, if we look at the social cost or external cost or externalities, then the share is much higher. The, you see the red part is much more important. For instance, animal product represent about 80% uh, of uh, agricultural land. It's about two thirds of uh, greenhouse gases emissions and also water pollution and soil pollution. And it's uh, all or essentially all zoonotic risk or anti or the, the antibiotics use. On the right uh, figure, uh, it's about uh, air pollution. As you know, air pollution is probably the number one environmental issue. Recent studies have shown both in, U in the US and in Europe that now agriculture and especially animal agriculture is the main contributor to air pollution. Uh, here this, uh, this um, figure uh, takes data from a PNAS study published a year ago and it computes the cost benefit ratio. So you have the cost is uh, monetized uh, um, mortality effect from air pollution, and the benefit is an economic value added of, a, of a, each sector of the American economy. And you see that the highest ratio, so the worst ratio, is that of animal ag ag production and aquaculture, uh, much, um, much above all the other uh, ratios of, uh, of, uh, of, of a different sector of the American economy. Okay, thank you very much, Nico. Nicola, so um, more globally, we've seen that uh, there are three types of negative externalities associated with uh, meat consumption. First, on animal welfare, uh, second, on the health system, and finally, on the environment. 
So the next question is how, what, what can we do? What kind of strategies can we implement to, to reduce those negative externalities? The first question that we can have uh, that we should deal with is the question of what we call sincere ignorance. So there is a strong difference, uh, discrepancy, I would say, between what we see, um, uh, what uh, animals in animal in farm, uh, the farming industry do. Um, on the left hand side, you can see by definition the animals you have access to, you have direct knowledge, are animals for which uh, everything is going quite well. Uh, by definition, if you can see them, they have access to outdoors, and uh, they have a, here on the picture they are, there is low density of animals. And they get, they get uh, for instance, natural light and so on. So those are animals uh, for, for whom everything is going quite well. Um, on the other hand, we know that uh, most of the production is currently done in intensive farms, uh, where for, there is high density of animals. Uh, there is, for instance, um, genetic selection to select animals that have um, a rapid gain in weight, for instance. Uh, also, you have no uh, outdoor access. You have no natural light here, and so on. So this is there is a discrepancy between what we see and what uh, most of the animals live, which may actually give uh, yield to incorrect beliefs about uh, what the average uh, animal in the farming industry uh, experiences. So in the first uh, work, I mean, uh, with uh, my co-author uh, Jan Stup, um, we tried to investigate to which extent people are really ignorant uh, about uh, what happens um, with um, for animals and. Uh, well, or whether they are just sincerely ignorant about that. So we, we made up an experiment where um, we try to assess uh, the impact of information campaigns on three topics. First, it relates to um, animal welfare, uh, so animal-based diets, sorry. Second, about uh, the negative consequences of alcohol consumption. And finally, uh, some um, questions relating to immigration. So we simulate an information campaign uh, with uh, UK nationals um, basically, we, we obtain the fact that um, informing people about the negative externalities associated with uh, animal-based diets improves their um, knowledge of people. Uh, here in our experiment, about uh, 20 uh, percentage points. Uh, in the same, almost the same way uh, as uh, for uh, alcohol consumption. And for in our experiment uh, with immigration, it has a information campaign has a stronger impact. So the two key messages that we find in this uh, paper is that first, there is some sincere ignorance. Uh, people are uh, receptive to some uh, information uh, regarding animal, uh, the externalities of animal-based consumption. The second uh, message that we also find is that there is also uh, information resistance. So only for animal-based diets, we find that some participants um, consciously or unconsciously uh, refuse to acquire new information regarding animal-based diets. Uh, while they, we find no such effect for alcohol or immigration. So in this paper uh, written with Nina and Eve, we also had a um, study of uh, psychology of uh, food uh, habits, let's say. Uh, we focus on what has been coined the, in psychology, uh, the meat paradox. So uh, what is the meat paradox? It's this idea that uh, there is a sort of uh, psychological cost. It's an hypothesis, uh, uh, psychological cost associated with uh, meat consumption for the following reason, because on the one hand, uh, consumers may, in general, they may like animals as shown on the picture, for instance, or they at least they may not like to feel responsible for the suffering and the death of animals. And on the other hand, they eat meat. And so that sounds a bit inconsistent. And the people may, may feel disturbed. They, they may feel a cognitive dissonance associated with that. So they may want to reduce that cost uh, if we see it as a cost. For instance, they may want to change their uh, consumption habit. Uh, but the problem is that it's difficult to change our food habits. There is a lot of resistance, and we like, uh, we like uh, eating meat. So an, another uh, direction, which is really the, the core of cognitive dissonance, is to try to adjust our beliefs. Uh, for instance, we may, as uh, just discussed by uh, Romain, we may ignore information or misinterpret information or find excuses or justifications. And this is what we explore theoretically. So to do that, we use a cognitive dissonance model by uh, Roland Benabou and Jean Tirole uh, that we apply to the consumption of meat. 
uh, and we find a set of results. Uh, so one result uh, we, when we do comparative statics analysis that we find is that uh, if we increase the parameter that controls the taste for meat, then we can see that there is a higher demand for, self, for self-deception because the person uh, eat more meats and though he, thus he has m- uh, higher uh, the uh, need for um, uh, adjusting uh, his or her beliefs. We also explore the effect of external parameters, uh, uh, for instance, the effect of price. So if we increase the price of meat, we can show that there is a direct impact on the belief. So price affects beliefs. Uh, why is that? Because the price affects consumption and by reduce, increasing price reduces uh, meat consumption. So reduces the need, the need for uh, uh, self-deception, and so uh, and so uh, as a consequence, it uh, it increases the price elasticity, the, the price elasticity of, of meat consumption. In uh, in the next study, so with Romain, uh, we focused on the on the impact of NGO, uh, animal advocacy NGOs are really uh, central uh, in uh, to to explain. Uh, of um, what's going on in the, in, in, in the issues regarding animal protection. And uh, it turns out that uh, there is often uh, quite a sharp difference between different types of NGOs. There are like some so-called uh, moderate NGO or welfareist NGO, uh, which, uh, which uh, recommend to, uh, let's say, reduce uh, meat consumption, increase plant-based uh, food, uh, in consumption, or they they recommend to improve animal welfare, and uh, at the uh, at the end of a spectrum, you have like more abolitionist uh, or radical NGO who uh, criticize the exploitation of animals and uh, recommend to go toward the vegan vegan world. We should stop eating meat consumption, e- eating meat. And so we try to explore the efficiency, the efficacy of these uh, of these messages by welfareist and abolitionist NGO both on beliefs, on pro-meat justification, uh, to see whether this uh, reduce, let's say, this justification, and also on actions. So we looked at um, the, don- the donation to, um, uh, to uh, Animal Advocacy Association and also at uh, the, 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 the petition uh, signature. And uh, what we found is that, uh, in general, both messages, both welfareist and abolitionist messages uh, change beliefs, uh, reduce pro meat justifications, but and that was a bit of a surprise to us. It did not affect the in the welfareist case the actions, and besides, uh, it even backfired uh, regarding the abolitionist message. It means that when we exposed participants to an abolitionist message, stop meat consumption, it reduced the, compared to the control their uh, willingness to help animals. So I think now we have uh, the second, second question. Okay, yep. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Nicolas. Romain, I think you know this. We still can't see you. I presume you have a problem with your video. I'm sure, hopefully we may be able to see you before the end of the session. Uh, second question here for us now. Which, in your opinion, is the first country to have authorized the sale of cultured meat? Singapore, China, Taiwan, or perhaps you do not know what cultured meat is? Over to you. Okay, I think we may have had enough time to think about it. A few more seconds. Here we go. Okay, we seem to have a majority of people, 62 pen. 62% 62% thinking it may be Singapore. Nicolas, Romain, is that correct? Yes, it, it is correct. Um, culture meat, so it was culture chicken, was authorized by a safety agency for the first time uh, in December 2020, so three months ago, in Singapore. Uh, so that was, uh, that was the, f- the first time and uh, the only time so far where a culture meat product was uh, commercialized. And uh, it's actually sold in one restaurant in Singapore nowadays. Uh, so culture meat, just for those who don't know, is uh, just uh, animal cells that are uh, that are cultured in uh, in vitro, so in the lab, in the bioreactors. 
and uh, and you can produce uh, meat in that way. So now it seems that we we know the most of the technique, but uh, still there is a way to go to to commercialize it uh, fully at large scale. And so um, with uh, so there there are, there are statements that this meat can really. Um, have drastic impact, uh, in particular regarding the environment. Of course, it will have drastic impact uh, regarding uh, animal welfare because we basically don't need other animals except for uh, for getting the animal cells. But also for the environment, it may reduce uh, very significantly the animal impacts, the uh, environmental impacts. And but the key, key question here is: uh, Will uh, consumers demand it, uh, buy it? Uh, and so we, um, in the, with Romain, that's that's a preliminary work. It's not published yet. We wanted to know more about this, so uh, we uh, we uh, did an experiment uh, to get more to know more about the willingness to pay for the product. And and we 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 ask them about a foie gras product. So we we are in Southwest. Uh, so we know well what is a foie gras. And it, it turned out that there is a French company out of the two startups producing, producing culture meat, there is one doing a culture foie gras, it's called Gourmet. And so we, we wanted to know whether this, uh, the, the participant would buy uh, cultured foie gras Gourmet. Of, of course, we cannot deliver that to the participants. So we, 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 have, we did a specific design still to have it uh, incentive compatible, as we say in economics. So I cannot say more now, I don't have time. But uh, under the veil of ignorance, let's say it's incentive compatible. We show that theoretically. And so, what's what's the, the willingness to pay of the participants? So we found you see you see you can see here a nice uh, demand curve. So about eighty percent of uh, participants are willing to try and to buy uh, cultured meat. Nevertheless, for the moment, we observe that the, the willingness to pay is pretty small, about three euros per 100 gram of a product on average. So for the sake of comparison, the current price uh, on average of the conventional foie gras is about seven euros per 100 gram. And at this price, we would only have 10% of the, of the participant buying, uh, buying culture de foie gras. So I think uh, we are done for the presentation and we are happy to get your questions. Thank you. Congratulations to both of you because you managed to respect exactly your timing. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to give you a terrible pun now. Please excuse me and say thank you for the food for thought. Um, let's go on to our questions. We have already quite a few questions come in. Thank you very much, everybody. Quick reminder on the um, how that works for those of you who missed the explanation at the start. Um, you have a small um, a button towards the bottom of your screen and in the menu bar in the Zoom, which is called Q and A. You click on there. You can open that up, answer, ask your own questions. Uh, you can also vote for what you think are the most interesting questions to ask, and we will work through them. I will try my best to choose the questions which seem to be the most popular. Um, I'm sure they are all very interesting. We'll try to get through as many as we can. And just a reminder also, if you're on Facebook, you can ask your questions in the comments section and we will bring those questions into the Zoom chat here. So please feel free also to get involved. Okay, um, nice to see you, Roma. We have your image finally. Um, let's take this perhaps a couple of these first questions which are very popular. Um, I think this is a good one to start with. How we're talking about animal welfare, but how do we measure animal welfare? Woman, you want to go? Or? I go for the next uh, question. Okay. So, okay. So, how we do do we measure animal welfare? So, uh, there are different uh, ways to measure it. Uh, we, you, we can, for instance, count uh, the number of uh, injuries or the rate of injuries, the rate of mortality. We can count uh, the, the, the rate of uh, stereotypies and so on. More intrusive method consists in uh, measuring, for instance, the blood the sample or the stress for cortisol and so on. And there are also some behavioral methods uh, used in ethology. We can, for instance, um, explore the willingness to pay, quote unquote, of animals uh, examining how they trade, for instance, more food with respect to more uh, space or more social contacts. But still now, we are very, very far from um, being able to really measure uh, preferences as we do in economics. 
and in particular to compare to compare them to uh, human preferences and among animal themselves. And I think in this presentation we have uh, really emphasized the behavioral economics aspects of I think uh, economics of animal welfare. But there is another branch which is uh, which is concerned, which is so social choice. And the VC, and we expect a lot from scholars in this field. We are not neither uh, Romain and me uh, expert on that field to really help uh, thinking about uh, the measurement of animal welfare, both theoretically and empirically. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Yes, not uh, not an easy one to to answer. There's a, a linked question actually coming up here, which is if we're thinking about the total welfare, should we incorporate animal welfare into um, the utility function of humans, or should it be completely independent? So maybe I start with this one. So that's a good question. Um, so there are different ways of uh, integrating animals into the social welfare function. So today, as most economics has been done, uh, animals were not considered at all. So it was mostly a, a human-centered, uh, totally human-centered um, utility uh, social welfare function. Uh, the next step could be to include animals indirectly, saying, yes, humans care about animals, and since we care about humans, we should also care about animals. But we could also say that, what, go one step further and say that uh, animals have uh, utilities on their own, so we should incorporate them. But here we could also say we still have a preference for humans. Uh, animals are part of society, but we still have a preference for humans. Or we could say we should have equal uh, interest for animals, uh, consideration for animals and humans. And finally, some authors also say that we, we could uh, have uh, give a stronger weight to the utility of animals because animals do not take part to decision making. They are only somehow the, the victims of our decisions. So we should um, give more weight to them to protect them even more. So there are in total five possibilities. Mm. I think economists are discussing that a lot. Uh, what has been done so far mostly is that, I mean, there are a few papers that say, uh, let's have a look when we incorporate them in, indirectly. But the author says at the end of their paper, we should consider the utility directly. So I think there is a change in mentality today. And uh, we have one work with uh, Nicolas Tresch on this, where we try to directly incorporate them. Um, that's a major uh, challenge. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Um, perhaps, whoops, could have a subject change because this question is coming up as being very popular. Um, coming back to your notion of cultured meat, which we've discovered with your fake foie gras. Um, uh, one of our audience members is asking, would it be useful to force customers to buy this biological green cultured meat or instead of factory farmed animals? The current price difference does not apparently get sufficient uptake of bi biological meat and just only offering that would bring the higher price down due to e e economies of scale. What do you think about that? Would you agree? Forcing a consumer to buy is quite a, <laughs> quite a strong uh, <coughs> statement, I guess. And could we, could we nudge them to buy? Nicola, yeah, you work on nudges? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, it's a, it's a big challenge to uh, to uh, to um, to ex explore how we can uh, influence consumers so, so that they can they can reduce their externalities associated with their food choices. So one uh, typical tool we can use is the fiscal tool. Mm -hmm. At this point, uh, there is no carbon tax on food products, for instance. The recent studies have shown that uh, if we introduce a carbon tax on uh, food products, it will quite double the price of uh, ruminant meat, for instance. So, and it quite significantly increase uh, also the, that, uh, the price of um, chicken and pork meat, but almost no effect on plant-based uh, food. So that would be a starting point. We can, of course, go beyond that and uh, include also other environmental externalities into the price. So that's one direction, but we know that there is a lot of resistance to change in price. So then nudges could be used. Landiver that you mentioned at the, begin at the beginning, thank you, Jenny, is a sort of nudge. Uh, they're, they're, Romain, do you think of some efficient nudge we can use? For cultural meat, I'm not sure. Uh, ah. more to, I mean, I think the question was for cultural meat, and I would just mention that forcing people may actually induce reactance. And um, people don't like to feel restricted in their choice. So I think, so this is all the, the, the current debate about positive or negative framing relating to uh, environmental policies, and we have the same here. I would just like to note on this that 
for instance, we consider the example of gourmet, which is about uh, foie gras. So uh, this is a real foie gras. It's just it's not uh, produced in the same way as uh, as usually. But um, so and they start with foie gras also because the the price for foie gras itself is relatively high. Uh, what we know for for the French uh, company is that they, they didn't want to communicate on their price when they come to the market in two years from now. But what they told us is that they're they're going to be a uh, market competitive. So uh, they start with luxury goods uh, where you have the largest uh, margin. Um, I'm quite sure that with that, they will, uh, they will be competitive, then they will increase uh, their, their uh, economies of scale, as you mentioned, and they will become even more competitive. So I'm quite confident that the market will, will, um, will work quite well here. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, and it might, seem, might be more a question of encouragement than forcing in that sense. Okay, um, we have a very popular question here, which is again coming to a different aspect about the NGO campaigns. I don't know if you've read that one, but um, uh, Vincent Claraz is asking, what would you say is the reason behind the backfire effect in the case of abolitionist NGO campaigns? Any ideas? So what? So in the paper, we interpret that as a reactance, what I just mentioned. Reactance occurs whenever um, people tell you what to do and you feel somehow restricted in your freedom of choice. Um, so the, the well-known example is whenever you have a friend who's smoking and you tell him or her, uh, you should definitely stop smoking. And if this person hears that every day, then at the end she keeps smoking uh, just because she doesn't want to be told what to do. So somehow we, we suspect that we obtain something similar here. Uh, people don't want uh, to, to be told that what they do is very bad and that they should stop uh, completely uh, eating meat. Um, so this is a popular, um, a popular explanation, uh, but maybe there are also other explanations. So should we perhaps tell them what we, what we do with our kids? We tell them, eat lots of meat, and they may stop. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I don't know whether it would work. Uh, so depending on the on the on the theory you you have in mind, but so you have two types of uh, reactants. Either reactance is uh, emotional or it is a uh, rational. So emotional reactance is really you stop thinking and you just do what people tell you not to do to reinstall your your freedom of choice. Or you have cognitive reactance. It is uh, when you try to find arguments to justify uh, what 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 you did was was right. Uh, so you have the those two types of uh, reactance effects. Mm -hmm. Perhaps also the difficulty in the debate is when people actually just quite enjoy it and perhaps think they should they should um, make an effort. They realize perhaps an effort should be made, but when you just quite enjoy something, it's very difficult perhaps to stop, you know, addiction ad effect as well. True. And a small example, because you mentioned Lundi Vert, for instance, mm. in reaction to Lundi Vert, there was some people uh, doing... Uh, Red uh, Saturday, like uh, eating meat on Saturday to just to to protest against uh, Landiver. So it was yeah. a typical case of reactance. Yeah, um, perhaps Nicola. Uh, um, some people listening uh, and watching us today will know what Landiver, the Green Monday, was. But could you perhaps explain a little bit more quickly for those who don't, and give us just a quick insight into what your findings were after the experience? Yeah, so um, uh, Laurent Beg, a psychologist, uh, really thought about this initiative and proposed me to, co to come on board. So uh, Lundiver is a meatless day. There exist main initiatives and uh, of meatless days in the world. Uh, so, but it, they didn't, there didn't exist any initiative in France, as far as we know. So we decided to implement uh, this initiative. So uh, the, the principle is that we suggest to people that they don't eat uh, animal, uh, animal uh, flesh on a specific day, so every Monday, every week. And, uh, and so we, 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 we wrote a sort of short article uh, with reasons for doing so, and we published that to, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Le Monde, which is one of the main newspapers in France, uh, with uh, signed by uh, people in academia, but also uh, act actors and actresses, famous, famous one. Thank you to them because it helped us to get a lot of visibility, a lot of buzz and a lot of many negative reaction as well as uh, Romain mentioned. And from that, we, there was a lot of um, discussions about this and, uh, and, um, and we observed that the significant part of the population seemed to be aware of that initiative. And for instance, all the, rest, the university restaurants now in France implement Lundiver. And we, we did a few studies on that. And for instance, we found that uh, 
some specific segment of the population are more willing to do land diver, like female, uh, more educated, uh, more liberal people, for instance. And we also had a psychological test. But one of the big five, and it's not a surprise, more people who are more open to uh, experience are more willing to participate in land diver. Okay, thanks. Congratulations on the initiative. Um, let's get back to our questions from the room. Uh, we have a question here on ethical and environmental concerns. Is cultured meat a potential answer for ethical and environmental concerns? And how does this affect the WTP? I don't know what WTP is. Yes, willingness to pay. Um, so uh, very good question. So about the moral impact. So basically, it will uh, it will uh, eliminate uh, suffering because uh, uh, animal cells don't suffer. They don't have interest. So uh, so that's uh, that's clear. But that, uh, that uh, morally should be an improvement. It's a bit more difficult talking about death because uh, on. We don't need really animals to do that. So, but on the other end, the animals don't exist any, uh, anymore, except for the biopsy. So then it raises the question of uh, what we deal uh, with, um, what we are going to do with these animals. Um, and so that's a bit, uh, so I discussed that in, in one of my papers. Uh, it's a bit it's a more challenging, I would say. About the environmental impacts, it's very difficult to, to tell because there, at this point, there, there are only a handful of studies and very exploratory, very, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty, but even now, given that the technique is really imperfect, still we can project a lot of uh, potential positive impact of uh, cultured meat, most uh, specifically on land use. It may massively reduce land use, which uh, opens many possibilities for natural regeneration, for instance, reforestation and so on. But also uh, it, it, it's about 75% uh, reduction projections in terms of um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, a lot of uh, reduction in terms of uh, pollution of water uh, and so on. So the big issue to understand here is that uh, with culture meat, we there is no more production of methane and nitrous oxide, but we need electricity energy to run the, the, the bioreactor. So we, we replace methane by CO2. And so, uh, so it's a bit of a trade-off, but still current projection suggests that we will, will reduce massively the, 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 the emissions of greenhouse gases. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a question on the policy side of things, a carbon tax on meat uh, seems to be a good tool, according to a certain number of scientists. But do you think the EU will be ready, prepared to implement such a tool anytime soon? So I think taxation is a, is a very difficult uh, issue in terms of public acceptance. So, um, for instance, so today we live in, uh, I would say, in the world, the post yellow jacket uh, world, uh, where, uh, I mean, we see that people uh, are kind of uh, bored with taxation, and especially if you remember, yeah, so in France, we had the, the uh, bonnet rouge, uh, so uh, red hats uh, in, uh, in, in Bretagne, where, uh, so it was a, um, a protestation against a, a carbon tax. So. I'm not sure today the, 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 the next step is having carbon tax. I think the next step at the European level is to uh, change the subsidies from the political uh, commune, uh, I don't know in English, sorry, so the, the general uh, uh, policy for agriculture uh, in Europe, uh, where today they still keep uh, founding uh, some uh, industries, some farm industries and large uh, intensive farms. So I think that the first step uh, for good Pigouvian world would be to, to stop those subsidies to industries that generate negative externalities. I don't know if you, Nicola, if you have something to add. Um, we'll see. I mean, there has been already several reports produced by the different uh, European countries uh, recommending to uh, tax uh, mm -hmm. food products and it will end up taxing more, mostly uh, meat products. Mm -hmm. uh, today, we go in the other direction because we subsidize uh, a lot of these products and we tend to subsidize more animal, uh, animal production. So at least, as uh, Romain suggested, we need to, to basically revert the tendency. I think uh, tax on uh, food product could be, could be a good idea. And I mm -hmm. think it will come in some countries at first. Uh, probably because uh, we, we also need to send a signal to, to consumers. Uh, and at this point, uh, greening the cap 
the common agricultural policy has, be, has been really not has not been working. So we need to try something else. Okay. Yeah, we had a question on this actually. We had a question on whether the carbon tax on meat had been experimented in certain countries and what was the effect. So you're thinking no. we haven't gone that way and we need a few Nowhere. countries possibly to do that. Okay. In any case, just, not in Europe, perhaps outside of Europe? No, not no. that I know. I don't think so. I'm not aware. I, ju I just like to, to mention because the, the we can maybe anticipate some of the effects uh, that would happen here. Uh, I just know some experimental works that look at how people change their uh, decision to eat when they have this uh, carbon uh, budget in mind. So and what we see is that, of course, people uh, decrease uh, red meat consumption, uh, which is good for the environment and also for health. But uh, we also see an increase in uh, chicken consumption. So there is a substitution from red meat to white meat. Um, so for the third externality, I mean, we're afraid it's quite bad news uh, because our chicken are have very bad rearing conditions. Um, so uh, we are. We, if you have a tax on carbon tax only, uh, we only solve part of the problem and we focus on one type of externality instead of uh, having a, a, a framework considering the three types of externalities. Okay, yeah, we have a question here which is kind of linked on the socially optimal price for meat. So perhaps to take into account the living conditions for chicken, the, the, the price uh, should perhaps be socially optimally increased so that people understand the difference between living conditions perhaps for chicken and I wouldn't dare to say what other kinds of animals have better living conditions but yes that's a very uh, good uh, follow-up question what is the socially optimal uh, price of meat we need to account for climate as Roman said we need to account for over environmental externality we may also want to account for health externality or internalities. We may uh, account for zoonotic risk because of now we know that it's a, it's a big issue. Antibiotic use as well. Uh, and then uh, that is, 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 uh, is, has not been researched in economics to account for animal welfare. And, uh, and then you can start thinking about the, opti the socially optimal uh, tax on uh, meat uh, you can understand that it's, uh, it's really a big uh, research question. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There was a question here, which I think was probably related to one of your um, graphs, which came in earlier, which was to ask if, if that says that higher, you were saying that higher income countries are higher meat consumers. I think this is perhaps related to something that you showed, just to make sure the public had understood. Yeah, let me just show you another graph. I'm sorry if my uh, video then stops. Um, so this is a graph from the um, a world in data using data from um, FAO again. And so this is where, where the, the relationship you can see between uh, meat consumption per uh, per capita here. And uh, here you have the log of the uh, um, country's um, income per capita, GDP per capita, sorry. And so you can see here, there is a strong um, correlation between the two. Uh, the larger, I mean, the more uh, development, the, more, the larger the economic development, then the, the higher the, the consumption of meat. Uh, you have countries like the US, uh, okay, here, but uh, as I told you, China here, it's, China here is also um, growing. And uh, so yeah, here for, at the lowest end, maybe it's a, it's a flat, it's a new relationship, but then there is a, a clear increase correlation, positive correlation between them. Uh, economic development and meat consumption. Yeah, if I can just complement that, um, there is also, there is evidence that indeed that a positive relationship, but it might, there might be some sort of inflection point. And uh, after some level of income, it seems both at the country level and also at individual level, um, we have a study with Céline Bonnet and Valérie Rosco about that, it seems that it starts to decrease. So uh, then it, uh, it's also a research question, why after some level of wealth, it seems that uh, meat consumption decreases. Is it for health, for instance, or moral reasons or other reasons? And uh, when the next question will be up to which point it will it will decrease, and whether this will be transferred in a sense to uh, to develop to developing countries. Okay, so you've got more studies on the cards in that case. Uh, okay, um, we still have quite a lot of questions open. Don't hesitate, everybody. We may have time to take one or two more. We have seven left on our list, so we'll keep going. We have eight minutes and seven questions. Um, looking to uh, EU policy again, um, Stefan Wimmer is asking what policy should do 
to improve the level of animal welfare in the EU farming sector, considering a global marketplace? So it's a very good question because uh, one of the big um, problem is the fact that we live in a very competitive international world. And uh, even if some country wants to put some, um, let's say, higher animal welfare standards, uh, the risk is that some other country with, with lower standards will, uh, will be more competitive and then the part of the population mm -hmm. will purchase these products. And the problem is that uh, we cannot uh, currently prevent or ban uh, the import of some uh, food product that does not satisfy uh, some, uh, some uh, animal welfare standards. So it's at the WTO that we should uh, fix that. Unfortunately, there is no sign that it would change, but that's indeed, uh, in, indeed a key question uh, for the future, uh, this issue of uh, being able to really uh, tax some import or ban some import because uh, the, the standards are lower. So it's a problem of leakage. We have a similar problem in climate change, for instance, that we have in, in, uh, in animal, uh, for regarding animal welfare issues. So just to, to complement, to add to what Nicola just said, uh, so I think there are two, I mean, relating to a question, two issues with animal welfare. First, animal welfare is a public good. So same as for climate change, everyone contributes. So your contribution is at the individual level. So you have the private cost of contributing, but you have the benefits are shared among everyone. So you have this tendency to uh, towards a zero contribution free rider problem uh, that you get, that you could have in Europe. It's a problem in Europe because you can ban, for instance, in a country uh, some production methods, uh, but you cannot ban the sale of the products in your country. So this so this is a nightmare in terms of a free riding problem. And the second point is that, uh, as Nicola mentioned, somehow the, the animal welfare is uh, so the, it's a cred credence good. So whenever you buy uh, transformed products from uh, another countries or eggs or whatever or meat, you don't know how it was uh, raised when you consume the product. So you, you do not have direct information, and this is a typically a problem. But this is also a problem for other ethical issues, like uh, when you buy uh, some clothes, you don't know currently if it has been uh, prepared by uh, Uyghurs in China, exploited, and so on. So the same type of problems uh, apply here. OK, yeah, thank you. Interesting. Um, I think, Nicola, coming back to Lundi Ver, there's a question on here, which I think you're going to be able to answer, because I think you did try um, some, I think Lundiver was taken also into some public, to some extent, to the public sector. We have a question here on whether that could be imposed on public buildings, schools, universities, what may be the barriers. And I know perhaps without imposing it, you did actually have some um, Lundiver initiatives taken up, for example, in school canteens at lunchtime. Yes, yeah, so uh, we uh, university canteens decided to uh, implement Lundiver, uh, and then there is a more general question of uh, having some, let's say, green uh, days in uh, public in, uh, institutions like um, you mentioned hospitals or other institutions. It's a very difficult issue. Currently in France, uh, there are, um, many people may be aware of that. We have a discussion about whether we should provide a vegetarian option in school canteens and. Um, you may know that it has been a very, very uh, hot issue. The po many politicians, including, including the, the, some uh, um, high-level ministers in France, take two positions on that, uh, the health uh, ministry and the environmental uh, the minister, of, uh, the minister of the environment were in favor, but on the other hand, the minister of justice and the minister of uh, I don't remember, agriculture uh, took a position against it. So it's really controversial topic. So we are not at the stage of imposing that. Uh, just an option is, a, is, a, is, a, is an issue. So it's a very difficult, and you can tell that what's going on around it really is, is a very uh, polarized uh, issue. Do, do, you, do, you want, do, do you want to add something on that? Oh, yeah, just uh, two weeks ago, there were the last, so there were the, some debates for the current law in France about um, the law against climate change. And some um, elected uh, deputies, they, they, they passed uh, uh, a bill to uh, forbid uh, canteens to have a vegetarian meal when there is only uh, one meal that is proposed. So they asked for uh, diversity in foods. And in the description of their, of their project, they say that uh, vegetarian meals are, are a nightmare and so on. So it's, it's, it was very badly implemented. But uh, last week, uh, there was a leak in a report of the uh, Ministry of Agriculture about uh, uh, how um, vegetarian meals are implemented in France in, in public schools. And the report is quite positive. 
Um, it requires sometimes to form people working in the canteens, but when they are well formed and when they when they cook well, uh, then it becomes tasty. Then the the, the students and the, um, by, by eating it and it's better also for environment and so on. Okay, yeah, so a lot to do, a lot of educational effort to make uh, on all the different levels for that. Okay, we have a few minutes for a few more questions. We have a question, um, actually, you, a question that's been here since the start, perhaps we should just attack it, although I think the, re the reply is probably very personal and subjective. Is it natural to care for animal welfare? Well, so that's, uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, so first, we, uh, we may say that um, uh, what is natural is not necessarily what is morally good. Okay, many things are natural, uh, they can be explained by evolutionary reasons, but they are not uh, morally good. Okay, so it's a very important question, very relevant question, but uh, not maybe in terms of uh, ethics. Uh, so, is it natural to, to care about animals? So, um, there is a lot of studies that concern uh, whether we, we care about others, humans versus humans, or whether anim animals care about each other, even across species. But interestingly, there is almost no study about humans caring for animals, as far as I know. Uh, so we need to learn about this. And there could be reasons for why we care about animals. Uh, for instance, we may we care about babies, and it could be a sort of extension to that. And it seems, indeed, that there is evidence that we care more about animals that look like babies, for instance. There is also um, an history of relationship with animals. Uh, we have developed partnership with dogs, with horses. Uh, so we learn to cooperate with them, and the better we care about them, the better we may cooperate with them, and probably the same with some farm animals. So we need to learn about this, but indeed it's one of the key questions, a bit outside of economics, I would say, but I uh, concern my colleague at EIST here, uh, biologists and so on, I think uh, they, it would be very nice that they, we learn more about these issues. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Uh, we managed to get through uh, a good amount of them. I'm not going to make any promises about written replies, but I think we should be able to keep the questions that haven't been answered, at least to feed into Nicolas and Roman's research questions and thoughts. So that will be useful, whatever happens. Thank you for those. Um, thank you, Nicolas and Roman, for being with us. Thank you for sharing your expertise on the on the subject and for answering so many questions. Thank you for being with us to our audience and for taking part. There will be a video recording on the web of the webinar available very shortly on TSC's uh, YouTube channel. And if you're interested in our research, please of course uh, visit our website at TSC and uh, the link will appear on the chat right now. And you can follow us on all our social networks, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. Stay uh, updated on upcoming events. We'll be making more webinars like this soon. Uh, Nicolas and Romain, if you have any final comments, then please over to you. Thanks a lot for the organization. Yes, we have a, a hidden organizational team behind us here. Thank you very much to them too. And have a good evening or good day, everybody, if you're on the other side of the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>